working work ethic of that neighborhood and using it to lure people in. And he's quietly building what may be the longest running Ponzi scheme in history. I blame myself. I keep saying, why did I trust this guy? This one decision I make just ruined my whole life. And later, Kevin Carney says he's invented a revolutionary computer program that trades millions of stocks with guaranteed 20% returns. Selling people a security the way Kevin did is a violation of every securities law known to mankind. It's outrageous and too good to be true. But investors, blinded by greed, are lining up to hand him their money. I've never seen that much cash in my life. The wads of cash people would bring in there. On August 1st, 2008, 50-year-old Philip Berry walks into the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn and asks to speak with a federal prosecutor. I emphatically told the U.S. Attorney that I didn't care what happened to me at that point as long as they would protect my clients. Berry, speaking exclusively to American Greed from prison in New Jersey, says he was looking to clear up some problems with his 30-year-old investment company. I realized that the investors' assets were in extreme jeopardy at that point. But it's even worse than he's letting on. Soon, U.S. Attorney Loretta Lynch will be stunned to discover that this unassuming man has quietly been running a three-decade-long financial scam right in her backyard. This is a guy who, up until that point in time, has, in fact, been able to talk his way out of a lot of trouble and a lot of dissatisfied people. And he thinks he can continue to do it. Philip Barry's story begins in 1978 in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn. It's one of the best and safest neighborhoods in New York City. The residents are mostly middle and upper middle income. It's home to generations of families who have formed tight bonds and an insulated community, says New York Daily News reporter John Marzulli. Bay Ridge is a neighborhood that's built on loyalty, it's built on family, it's built on hard work. Philip Berry has lived here since high school. To most, he's just a neighborhood guy living a quiet life in his $700 a month rent control department. He lived sparingly. He didn't wear fancy clothes or drive a fancy car. And he was well known in the neighborhood. He may live frugally, but even Barry admits he's always been interested in other people's money. I'd started trading stocks for myself at about age 15. I did very well and then began to help friends with investment advice in college. And so I decided to pursue it as a profession. After graduating from college with a degree in business management, Barry opens Leverage Management Company on 82nd Street. At first, he does taxes for friends and family, but soon he's offering investments in stock options to a growing list of satisfied neighbors. U.S. Attorney Loretta Lynch has spent nearly two decades prosecuting political corruption and financial crimes in New York. She says Barry used his neighborhood status to gain his victim's trust. If I want to trust someone with my money, who better than the local kid made good? Because he understands my needs, and he understands why I'm not looking for the Wall Street flashy guy. I'm looking for someone that I can relate to. I never advertised the leverage group. It grew by referrals from very satisfied clients over the years. If you looked closely at Philip Barry, what would you see? You would see a person who looked selfless. You've known him for years. He doesn't run around with women. He doesn't gamble. Sounds like somebody you could trust. And if you look closely at this famous movie poster, just behind John Travolta, you'll see one of those satisfied customers. Alex Marchek is a third generation funeral director. But back then, he was a kid that liked movies and dancing. Passions that scored him a bit part in Saturday Night Fever, shot in Bay Ridge. I was a good dancer. It was fun. That was a pretty cool time. In 1988, Alex and his family invest $70,000 with Phil Berry. 
His name did come up because I know people that had accounts with him and back and forth, so, you know, I know he was there. One lure may be the 12.5 to 21% returns Phil Berry's been promising every year, making him very popular around the neighborhood. He promised everyone the same rate of return, and uh, he took care, like a lot of con men do, so even though he was guaranteeing a rate of return, which is always a red flag, it would change from year to year. After a few years, Marchek pulls his initial investment out of Barry's leverage group. He gets the return that was promised, although his payout took longer than expected. When you did get money, it wouldn't be at all at one time. It would be dribs and dribs. Alex doesn't know. That's because Phil Barry's not a very good investor. He's losing money investing in stock options, and those guaranteed returns, they're just numbers he's making up. Certainly, he realized very early on that he was never going to be a successful investment advisor, but he quickly then realized he could have the facade of one just as easily with less work than actually doing the work. To keep the leverage group operating, Barry decides to funnel new investor money to pay off any other customers who are looking to cash out. On the surface, Barry's leverage group is thriving. Thanks to those guaranteed returns, money is flooding in. Between 2004 and 2008 alone, he receives more than $26 million from investors. It is the longest running Ponzi scheme that we in law enforcement are aware of. For about 31 years, Philip Barry systematically deceived over 800 people. He swindled them, every single one of them. And all that time, he's honing his carefully crafted everyman image to lure more investors in. Next on American Greed. He absolutely was a predator, and he really thought of himself as being at the top of the food chain and looking down on everyone else. A sudden windfall for Alex and Holly Marchek will turn into an endless nightmare, thanks to Philip Berry. I think about it every day, every minute of my life. I think about it. I keep going back and say, please, can I just wake up and we just change this day? In 2006, Alex and Holly Marchek of Homedale, New Jersey, have just learned some incredible news. They've sold the building housing their Bay Ridge funeral parlor for $2.3 million. It was something I never envisioned before in my whole life. It was just no worries, just doing whatever you want to do and enjoying life. Alex wants to keep his windfall secure. And Philip Barry, the neighborhood guy he successfully invested with decades earlier, seems like the answer. He was like an eccentric, the way he walked around, and he never had no flesh. So maybe this uh, non-flesh drew in us poor suckers from Bay Ridge that were a trustworthy community. Barry has close ties with several neighborhood banks. His track record and strong word of mouth convinced the Marcheks to give him their money. He was using legitimate banks. So how unsafe could it have been? In my eyes, that's what I thought. <clears throat> and I guess I was wrong. I placed $2,150,000 with Phil Barry on March 9, 2006. And I told him, I'm just leaving it with you for a year. And he goes, oh, absolutely. Barry doesn't tell them how he's investing their money. And his record keeping is as eccentric as he is. Meet columns of handwritten notes inside his clients' folders detail how much Barry has taken in and what, if anything, he's paid back out. The operation may be low tech, but it's worked for Philip Barry just fine for 30 years, says U.S. Attorney Loretta Lynch. He did not have the sophisticated financial software that any investor would have assumed he would have had. And frankly, he didn't need it. Money came in and money went out. You write it down on one column and you send it out from another. He does send out quarterly statements that show impressively large gains. But these are completely fictitious as well. They looked very professional. He made sure that they had a number of things on there that gave the illusion of respectability and the illusion of success, like branch offices. There were victims in other cities, but there were no locations in other cities. Every year, Barry plays the stock market, he loses money. 
But that's not his only losing proposition. Starting in the 80s, he spent more than $6 million buying up hundreds of acres of pristine wooded property around the Catskills. Barry will later claim he hoped to develop the land to pay back his investors. But if that's the plan, he's not sharing it with them, as he will later admit during bankruptcy proceedings. Were any investors given a piece of paper, like a certificate or some documentary evidence that this property was being held for their benefit? I don't believe so, no. Is there anything in the deed that evidences that this entity is holding the property for the benefit of the leverage investor? No. From prison, Barry tells American Greed he had big plans for the land. He wanted to develop upscale residences along Lake St. Joseph. I always felt that it should be developed in a way which respected the natural beauty, which is why I wanted to do only single-family homes on large lots and the houses set back well from the lake to preserve the beauty of the lakefront. But Barry's dream of being the real estate mogul of the Catskills runs into some problems. He misses mortgage payments and quickly gets behind with his property taxes. But that's not what brings Barry down the way he tells it. He blames his downfall on birds. I failed to anticipate that a pair of bald eagles would build a nest at the lake. And if they build a nest on your land, the state uh, effectively takes your property and they give you no compensation for it. Isn't it a sick irony that the, the symbol of the country, which stands for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, has just about taken all three from me and hurt hundreds of investors as well? But Phil Barry's real money problems have little to do with eagle nests. Until now, he's been able to keep his scam going for 30 years, thanks to word of mouth and good luck. One of the reasons he was able to keep it going so long was actually one of the reasons why it's so tragic. He didn't steal huge amounts of money at a time but he consistently had people investing in him over a long period of time. But in 2007, the foundation of his scam cracks, the economy sours, and investors start looking to cash out. When Alex Marchak asks for his $2.1 million back, Barry gives him 80 grand to stall him. And when that fails... Then the checks started bouncing. Then that was it. Everything started falling apart. Alex can't bring himself to tell his wife there's a problem, but his attempts to recover the money are fruitless. His stories, they weren't adding up, and he was just flooding the neighborhood with bad checks. Next on American Greed, Barry's financial empire crashes down around him. I realized that the investors' assets were in extreme jeopardy at that point. And Alex Marchek must come clean to his family tell his wife he fears their money is gone. We weren't normal anymore, and we still had a normal. For nearly two years, Alex Marchek has carried a lonely secret. The $2.1 million he's given to Brooklyn investor Philip Barry has disappeared. Why should I worry my wife during this time? Let me just let me just try to handle it myself and see what happens. But the stress is taking a toll, and his wife Holly watches him slowly deteriorate. She suspects he may be having an affair. And being a wife, of course I thought the worst. I thought something was going on maybe between him and I because he wasn't the same anymore. Even their teenage son, Alex, sees his father falter before his eyes. I saw something change. The smile, the light in his face went out. And uh, there was no more carefree. There was no more wanting to spread the goodness. Finally, in 2008, Alex breaks and comes clean. First to his wife and later his son. He hasn't had an affair, but Philip Barry's betrayal is devastating. When I found out, I just couldn't believe it. You know, it just, you don't want to believe it. I'll never forget the day I found out. He was standing in the master bedroom, looking out the window, hysterically crying. And I walked in on that. And I didn't know what was going on. Alex and Holly unite 
and devote their time to getting their money back, with Barry always promising them the checks in the mail. It was an ongoing, torturous nightmare of, of believing, not believing, hoping, denying, total denial. They are able to recover $150,000 before Barry decides he's returned enough. We got a couple of checks, and then everything else just started uh, bouncing. And matter of fact, my bank at the time told me, stop bringing checks from this company. They won't accept it. In fact, during a three-year period between 2005 and 2008, Barry bounces nearly 2,000 checks, running up $46,000 in bank fees. The Mark checks are furious, believing banks allowed Barry to thrive. And they feel better oversight would have shut him down years ago. 2005 alone, Mr. Barry bounced 593 checks, totaling fees of $17,790. You can't have a Ponzi scheme without a bank. And the banks enabled Phil Barry's Ponzi scheme for 30 years. The banks involved have declined comment to American Greed. But bankruptcy trustee Alan Nisselson says he doesn't believe they are culpable. We didn't see anything which was what known as a smoking gun, where it said, oh, the banks knew that this guy was a fraudster, and they were going along with him. In 2008, a fed-up group of six investors filed a lawsuit against Barry, saying he owes them hundreds of thousands of dollars. To buy time, on August 1st, Barry ducks into the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York and asks to speak with a prosecutor. He did not see a way out, and so he pivoted and thought, let me convert myself into the poor, beleaguered investment advisor who needs the government's help to sort this out. Barry doesn't volunteer much, but he does admit he owes investors roughly $50 million that he no longer has. There was no grand admission at first. He just had had this terrible turn of events, and he definitely did admit to being underwater, as he put it. Barry lets investigators into his office to look at his files. They are stunned to find Barry's meticulous notes, all handwritten inside victims' folders, pointing back to a 30-year scheme. Money would come in, and it would go right back out to answer a demanding client who was angrily saying, send me my money now. So we were able to see the actual Ponzi scheme operate over the course of the years of the records that were there. But that's not all they discover. You would see notes that he would write about possibly, you know, what, what can I say to this person to, to really get them off my back? What story can I spin to push them off and keep this going a little while longer? Three months later, on Halloween, Barry files for bankruptcy. At his hearing, he wears old clothes and shoes with holes in them. And he doesn't hesitate to admit to lawyers that he's been running a Ponzi. Most, if not all, of the $10 million was not used to purchase stock or options or real estate, but actually was used in large part as redemptions to other investors. Correct. He's kept little money for himself, and the only assets he still holds are 1,600 acres of heavily mortgaged property in upstate New York. Barry spent just over $6 million on them. But now he claims they should be worth more than $100 million. There's kind of a myth out there that it was a bad investment. Not only was it a good investment, it was an extraordinarily good investment. It was exceptional in its appreciation during that period of time. The market disagrees. Nine months after being appointed trustee, Alan Nisselson auctions off the Sullivan County real estate, Eagles and all, for $6.3 million the same amount Barry owes on their mortgages. Nisselson also files more than 30 lawsuits to recover some of the money Barry has stolen. He settles them for a fraction of what they are worth. We wound up only collecting maybe $300,000 of funds uh, from these 35 lawsuits. We've sued for millions. That money, plus an additional recovered $250,000, means that of the $40 million Barry's taken in, only $550,000 remains. For families like the Marcheks, that's just pennies on the dollar. We got the uh, final settlement from the bankruptcy to say that our grand total that we're going to receive 
on a, over $2 million, about $5,000. In October 2010, Barry is indicted, and after a week-long trial, he's found guilty of securities and mail fraud. Philip Barry is sentenced to 20 years in prison, but the mystery of why he stole millions from more than 800 investors may never be answered. For Philip Barry, I think the American dream was the respect and admiration that was lavished upon him by the people of Bay Ridge and their family members, that community, which was his life. That was the center of his universe. From prison, Brooklyn's Bernie Madoff claims he's innocent and that he feels horrible for everything that went wrong. My investors know that despite what has happened and what they've heard or been told, I'm still the same person that they originally trusted. And as long as I'm still alive, they should not consider their money lost. But that doesn't help families like the Marcheks, who must deal daily with the devastation Barry has left behind. Alex and Holly both suffer from anxiety. Retirement is only a dream. And they've been forced to sell their home of 16 years. You can't stop the pain, because every day it's the same thing, the same feeling, and the same prayers. And you just want your prayer to be answered so desperately. Next on American Greed, Kevin Carney is telling the neighborhood he's found the secret to unimaginable wealth. Next thing you know, he's making his family and his friends so rich. But he's about to prove that greed is contagious. They would line up at his door each morning with bags of cash, stacks of cash, and hand it to him, and he just couldn't say no. Bill Harmoning is chief special agent with the Illinois Securities Department. For 20 years, his job has sent him across the state investigating financial fraud. In October 2008, he's working a case with another agent who casually mentions he's just heard rumors about an investment that sounds too good to be true. The sister of his nanny had mentioned that she was in an investment that was paying 20% per month. Of course, we know that that's not realistic. That comes out to over 700% annualized. It won't take long before Harmoning discovers a bizarre scheme that's been operating in plain sight for three years and making a lot of people very wealthy. The most unique thing about this case is we never received a complaint. We never received a complaint because people were getting paid. The kingpin of this scam is an unlikely 47-year-old named Kevin Carney. Carney's living 20 miles west of Chicago in Elk Grove Village. He's never had trouble with the law, but he's not much of a businessman either, which might explain why he's desperate to try something new. He had failed at other endeavors. He had never been successful at anything, and I think that was his primary motivation. Carney's also sitting on some debts from when his last business, a storage company, failed in 2004, according to bankruptcy trustee David Leibowitz. He owed a bank uh, uh, maybe six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars or so uh, as a result of that failed business operation. This setback will become the springboard for a surprising new business plan when Carney, who has no known finance expertise, decides he's going to start a stock investment firm. In his mind, it was a great idea, and I think he legitimately had it in his mind that he could help some of his family and friends, but it got away from him, and he got in too deep. Sometime in 2005, he opens his unnamed company out of his Elk Grove Village home and begins offering a likewise unnamed investment opportunity to friends and family. It's the Kevin deal. You, everyone was given an account number, Usually a three-digit account number, sometimes a two-digit account number. Carney has no securities license, and he never gives his clients an actual contract. In fact, he offers nothing that traditional investors might expect. And they invested in this transaction without a prospectus, without an offering memo, without a circular, without anything, just on uh, a conversation with Kevin, and then they give him money. But there is one unique feature Carney does offer, and it's enough to convince those around him to throw caution to the wind. A 
a guaranteed 20% rate of return per month. This is a red flag to any kind of a sophisticated investor because the return is going to vary depending upon results. And yet people put their heads in the sand and said, you know, I'm happy, I'll take my money. And they did. To sell his story, Carney says he's created a computer program nicknamed Candlesticks after the bar charts brokers use to describe stock price movements. It looks fancy, but it's hardly unique. He told people that he developed it himself, when in fact it was just a tool available to anyone on E-Trade, which is where he had his account. Carney claims his program allows him to anticipate a stock futures movement before that information is available to the rest of the world. It's not as crazy as it sounds, admits Bill Harmony. In what we call technical analysis, what you do is you look at the movement in the price of a stock and you predict future movements based on past movements. But it's no guarantee. Stock prices are unpredictable, and technical analysis is a dangerous way to play the market, even if Kevin Carney's program seems to be beating the odds. Soon, small investments in the Kevin deal are generating huge returns, and Carney's beneficiaries aren't afraid to flaunt their newfound wealth, says David, who asks that his last name not be used. You start seeing the stuff they have, it's pretty much a given that you, you kind of want to figure out what's going on there. One of David's new friends and golf buddies is Craig Gutowski, who seems to be benefiting particularly well from Kevin Carney. He goes, Dave, do you know how much money I make? And I'm like, I have no idea. And he goes, 50000 a month. Thanks to word of mouth like Gutowski's, Carney expands his operation quickly. Before long, he's accepting money from just about anyone who turns up. Anyone who had the cash to give him to invest, I don't believe he turned anyone down. Why wouldn't you invest with somebody like this, you know? Bill Harmoning suspects people were drawn to Carney precisely because his promises were so incredible. We see those that simply don't know any better and truly do believe they're going to get this return. And then there are those, they know in their gut that this thing is going to be worthless at some point but they see other people making money and they just can't stand the idea of being left behind. It gets so busy that by the spring of 2008, Carney can't handle the steady stream of people showing up at his house at all hours with money. He relocates his still unnamed company to a nondescript office nearby. Inside, he sits in front of a row of computers that feed him a nonstop flood of stock information. You walk into his office and you see a lot of monitors with a lot of charts and it looks quite impressive because he certainly was buying and selling a lot of stock. Using a strategy only he knows, Carney is feverishly trading up to $200,000 at a time. But he actually is losing money, nearly $500,000 a year. There's only one way to keep the good times going. Most of the people who got money back were simply being paid back from the money he took in from other investors. It may not be a surprise he's running a scam, but eager investors are willing to look the other way, as long as the money keeps flowing. If you invested just 10 grand in this guy, it's generating what he's promising, $2,000 a month. So you let that roll a couple months, next thing you know you're making four grand a month. A lot of these people weren't even working. Coming up on American Greed, when times are good, Kevin Carney can't keep the investors away. They're going in there and handing him money, piles of money. I mean, I've never seen so many thick $100 bills in my life. But the good times aren't going to last long. He had a time bomb on his hands. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but he just couldn't bring himself to shut it down. Would you gamble your money on Carney's scheme? Listen to David explain why it sounded legit at americangreed.cnbc.com. Feeling greedy? Want more than your share of behind-the-scenes dirt? Follow at American Greed TV on Twitter. We'll be right back. By 2008, Kevin Carney's unnamed investment business is thriving in the Chicago suburbs. And Carney seems a solid, if unassuming, money manager. He drives a 2003 Mercedes and lives in a small suburban house. 
but investigators suspect a flashy lifestyle wasn't what motivated him in the first place. He had never been successful at anything. I think it was a big boost to his ego to have all these people looking up to him and depending on him for payments. And even though he didn't take a lot of the money himself, I think that was his primary motivation. But Carney does like money. He tells his clients cash is king. And he carefully builds an unusual business plan around that motto. Most of this was done in cash payments. Very few people wrote checks. He wrote very few checks. Checks that he did write, he would write for cash or buy cashier's checks. In 2008, David, who asks that his last name not be used, has had enough of watching from the sidelines as his friends get rich. My friend's in for half a million dollars, him and his family, and he's begging me to go invest in this because it's, you can't lose. David says another friend has made nearly $340,000 since signing on with Carney's unnamed investment company. She wasn't working. She was a divorced mom, didn't take alimony, didn't take child support, brand new cars, donating $10,000 a month to the local church she went to. Everyone around him seems to be living large, thanks to Kevin Carney. And although a 20% return should be a red flag, David says it seemed worth the risk at the time. It was for real. I mean, Warren Buffett didn't get rich making 1% on a 10-year CD. In May 2008, David meets Kevin Carney face to face. Carney explains how his proprietary software allows him to forecast what the market will do minutes before it actually happens. So they had this advantage that it wasn't illegal because it was speculation. So eight times out of 10, it was accurate. And it's like, okay, so that takes care of that question. He told me every night that the records got locked up in a safe and that his attorney had a CD of all the accounting if something was ever to happen to Kevin. It doesn't take much to convince David. After all, he's surrounded by the Kevin Carney success story. Everybody around you getting rich and spending lots of money. Why wouldn't you invest with somebody like this? David starts off small, investing $10,000. But when he sees his first statement, he quickly ups the ante. Soon, he's invested $409,000. And the statements he's receiving show he's making buckets of money, even if he hasn't actually seen it yet. Right here, by the end of August, I've already made $85,000 in um, four months. Even if he did have reservations, David's caught up in the returns he's seeing. He doesn't want to rock the boat and risk ruining a good thing. I don't want this guy kicking me out. You know, I don't want him saying, take your money and I'm never investing for you again. I was going get, to get you rich and then I'd be on the curb and everybody else is still getting rich. It's a gravy train few of Carney's investors are willing to climb off of, says Illinois Security Department Special Agent Bill Harmony. People were literally lining up at his office door in the morning and waiting for him to open up so they could come in and give him cash. Between January 2007 and October 2008 alone, Carney takes in $17 million from hundreds of people. But the truth is, most of that money is being paid to other investors or disappearing into Carney's failed investment strategy. He was doing classic day trading where he would hang on to a stock no more than 10 or 15 minutes and he would sell as soon as it moved in that direction to make a small profit. The idea being that over time, enough of those small profits add up to a pretty large profit. It might sound good to someone who doesn't know better, but investigators say there's a big catch. It just wasn't a strategy that worked very well. By the time that you have predicted the movement of a stock and attempt to take advantage of that, it's usually too late. And in his case, it almost always was. In three years, he'll lose $1.5 million, executing nearly $300 million worth of doomed trades. He knew he was only going to get deeper. In his words, he just couldn't stop. Next on American Greed, Carney recruits others to keep the money flowing. You think he would have been robbed or something? There's so much cash going around that place. But soon, the thieves will turn on each other. And of course, the hole just gets deeper and deeper.
By 2008, Kevin Carney has more than 400 investors clamoring for the big returns he's promised. To keep money flowing into his suburban Ponzi scheme, Carney begins offering incentives to some of his closer confidants so they can help lure new investors. He would offer them a cut of that 20%. So some people got 3%, some people got 5%. The remaining 15% or 17% went to the investors they brought in. These finders will earn more than $1 million worth of commissions selling Carney's scam across the Chicago area. One of them is 42-year-old Craig Gutowski. He's got his back to the camera in this blurry picture taken after a long day of golf. The men in the foreground are counting stacks of money. $50,000 total that Gutowski's been showing off, according to another Carney investor who snapped the picture. He had packs of 10 grand and $100 bills. He had five of them. So I was on the other side of the table. Craig's up, leaned up against the bar with a cocktail, and my friends are counting all the money, and I just figured, this is cool. But Gutowski's got a secret of his own. He's actually been skimming the money that he's supposed to be giving Carney. He thought he was making so much money in this investment, he could bring in new investors of his own, never tell Kevin Carney who they were, make enough to pay them back, and they would never have known that he kept most of their investment. Gutowski pockets more than $100,000 in 10 months, spending it on vacations and Texas Hold'em marathons at his Cary, Illinois home. He went and bought a shop that he had the floor epoxied done on it. He had a poker room built in this car shop where he worked on cars. Gutowski will be convicted of theft in 2012 and sentenced to 12 months work release for his role in Carney's scam. With friends like that, it's not surprising Kevin Carney is starting to run into trouble of his own. He still had plenty of investors coming in, but he was starting to to get low on funds. And I think within the next six months or so, he's not gonna be able to pay people their promised interest. In the fall of 2008, David decides he wants to pull his $409,000 investment out. He's able to get $10,000 back without hassle. So he makes an appointment to get the rest. I remember the date, it was October 17th. I was supposed to go to get a check for my full principal amount and they promised me the check could be ready. But Carney's receptionist calls days later with shocking news. His money has been seized by the state of Illinois. They shut the accounts down. They're having some issues with the, the amounts of transactions he's moving, which wasn't true at all. And we can't cut your check at this time. I'm like, are you kidding me? The beginning of the end comes one week earlier when Illinois Securities Department agent Bill Harmoning first hears about that unbelievable 20% return. His suspicions are confirmed when he digs into Carney's records. When we look in a bank account and we see large amounts of money coming in, and then when we see that money going out immediately to another individual, we know we have probably a Ponzi scheme going. We saw that in the case of Kevin Carney. After the accounts are seized, all that remains is $500,000 and hundreds of stunned clients. It's the worst feeling in the world. It's sickening, and everybody's lives are ruined. You can't sleep at night. That's all you think about. You know, your nest egg's gone. And if investigators are hoping to find hidden mountains of cash in Carney's basement or an offshore bank account, they're soon disappointed. His frugal lifestyle has left him with few assets. We seized, I believe, five accounts and a used car. David is able to recover another $34,000 on top of the $10,000 he's already collected. But when he receives his next check from Carney, his luck runs out. Of course, I went to cash it, and it bounced. We knew at this point in time he was out of money. David and 11 other investors try to force Carney's hand by petitioning the court for involuntary bankruptcy in May 2009. But the plan backfires when trustee David Leibowitz sues David for the $44,000 he's recovered. Despite the fact David's lost more than eight times that much, nearly $365,000. You're already knocked out, and then you're just starting to get back up, and you get knocked right back down again. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. No one should feel 
immune from my exercise of trustees' powers and rights. I have to exercise these powers and rights in the fiduciary interest of all creditors. Leibowitz eventually drops that suit, but he does continue to target the nearly $7 million that some investors pocket from Carney's scheme. So far, he has recovered just over $800,000. But there is little chance the money will ever be distributed back to the investors. In bankruptcy, the administrative expenses come first. So the cost of my lawyers, the cost of my accountants, I have to charge the estate for being the bankruptcy trustee. Expenses as well are, are considerable. They have to be paid off the top. And there's another group waiting in line as well. The IRS wants more than $500,000 in back taxes. The Internal Revenue Service considers the money that Kevin Carney got to be income. And he hasn't filed income taxes return, and he hasn't paid income taxes on it, and they've sent me a bill for it. In October 2009 and March 2010, Carney is indicted and charged with crimes including mail fraud and securities.